Well, good morning, 11 o'clock church. My name is Warwick. If I haven't met you before, it is great to uh, see you here this morning. It's going to be my privilege to open the scriptures with us this morning. If you're watching online or you're in platinum seating, it's uh, great to have you here as well. And I want to say the typical uh, Easter greeting uh, on a day like this is Good Friday or something like that. Anyway, don't worry about me. I want to start by getting you to think, ask you this question. Have you ever witnessed a miracle? I want to stand before you this morning and tell you that my wife and I have experienced the greatest miracle that has ever been seen by the whole of humanity. And it involved our son, Peter. He's the one on the right. Uh, This is a selfie that our son, Tom, who's on the left, took this week and put the caption with it, uh, morning cuddle with my least favorite family member. Anyway, look, this is a miracle that parents will understand. Others of you who haven't yet been parents may not. When when Pete was in his teens, his bedroom was a complete and utter pigsty. It it was full of uh, sound equipment and computers. Uh, There were empty Coke cans strewn everywhere. He never put his clothes away. He never emptied his bin. Uh, On a good day, you could sometimes see the carpet. Uh, it, It got to the point where we decided for the sake of family harmony that uh, it just wasn't worth fighting over it. So when he was about 14, we decided that we would just close the door. (laughs) And as long as we could close the door, his punishment was to live in there. (laughs) That was ground central for a couple of years. Two years ago, Caroline and I moved out. And we came here to Dubai and left the kids in a unit back in Australia. And that's when the miracle happened. Uh, We've now been informed by Tom, our eldest son, that Pete now complains when he does the washing up and leaves clean dishes stacked in the dish drainer and doesn't put them away. He's a complete and utter neat freak. Uh, The the unit is tidy 24-7. Caroline and I just look at one another and marvel. We have no idea. Some say it's a miracle. Others say he's just grown up. Uh, You you decide. Uh, I think it's a miracle. Uh, My dad uh, is going to turn 83 this year. Um, He's had four different bouts of serious types of cancer. Uh, We started when he was uh, 46, getting cancer. Uh, He's still really remarkably healthy. Uh, I don't know if it's a miracle. But I do know that God has given us 37 years with him that we never expected. Over the past, well, a whole bunch of weeks, we've witnessed a whole series of certifiable miracles that Jesus has done during his ministry. We've seen him heal the sick. We've seen him raise the dead. We've seen him feed the crowds and calm the storms. We've seen him cast out demons. We've Well, there's a whole stack more miracles we could have seen. We didn't see Lazarus raised from the dead. This morning, we're going to see what I believe is Jesus' greatest miracle of all. This is an outline of where we're going. The greatest miracle of all, I want to say to you, though, is not the resurrection, as good as that was. The greatest miracle I believe that Jesus was involved with was actually a death. A, A deliberate death, a predicted death, a chosen death... His death, which is only appropriate to talk about on a day like today, because today is Good Friday. And if you ever wondered why they call it Good Friday, there's there's a famous BC cartoon that goes a little like that, that makes Good Friday make sense. One caveman says to the other, I hate the term Good Friday. The other responds, why? The answer My Lord was hanged on a tree that day, which prompts the question from the other caveman. If you were going to be hanged on that day and he volunteered to take your place, how would you feel? And the punchline? Good. (laughs) Have a nice day. It's Good Friday. Let's pray that God would help us to understand his word this morning. Pray with me. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, as we look at your word together this morning, open our eyes, unstop our ears and soften our hearts so that we can hear about this death 
not as a piece of history, but as something that was done for us, for me, personally. Help us to get that and to live in the light of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Here's the outline of where we're going. The miracle we're going to be thinking about this morning is Jesus' death. And as with every miracle, the first thing we need to do is actually establish that it actually happened. Because there are plenty of people out there in the world who don't think that, well, don't think that miracles occur, let alone that this particular miracle occurred. And there are some in the 21st century who aren't even convinced that Jesus himself lived, let alone died. Then there are some who claim that it wasn't Jesus on the cross. They say that when Christians claim that the Romans killed Jesus, it was actually the son of Mary, the the messenger of Allah. They didn't kill him, they say, nor did they crucify him. Only someone who looked like him was who they crucified. So you've got to ask as we begin, did Jesus actually die? Was it him up there on the cross with his mum at the foot of the cross or was it somebody else? And at this point, we've actually got to examine the evidence. Let's start by looking at the evidence from outside the Bible. Let's go to Flavius Josephus. Josephus wrote at the end of the first century AD around the time that John's gospel was being written. Josephus was an historian. He was Jewish. uh, He was no friend of the Christians. And he was writing for a Roman audience. And he describes for Rome the fall of Jerusalem, the conquest of Palestine, and the high points of the Roman rule during that first century. His works, particularly the uh, the Wars of the Jews and the Antiquities of the Jews, are some of the most important historical documents to give us a handle on what happened in the first century Roman world of the day. When we read Josephus, we expect him to speak about Herod. And he did, because Herod was a king. We expected him to speak about Pontius Pilate, and he did because he was a governor after all. What is surprising is that his account contains information about John the Baptist, about Jesus, James's brother, as well as about Jesus himself. I want you to think about it for a moment. Imagine uh, someone was writing the history of Australia, from 1963 to 2016, my lifetime. How many references in that great history do you expect there to be of Warwick to Jersey? None. Okay, go to your home country. Right? Your home country's history's being written. Will you even get into a footnote? No. Why? Because like me, you're nobody. Right? You don't make decisions that shape nations. You're not a political leader. You're not a great king. We wouldn't even get a line. So why does John the Baptist get a gig in Josephus? Because he shaped a nation. Why does, Je- why does Jesus, a dead Jewish carpenter from a hick town, why does he get a quote like, this one. Have a look at it. About this time, it'll come up on the screen, there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. Why write this about Jesus? Because he lived. Because he made a significant impact on the nation in a particular generation, because many of the Jews and Greeks followed him. He was a significant political and religious figure in the first century. But there's more. For Josephus goes on to say, he goes on to say that Pilate had him condemned to a cross. That is, Pilate executed him. That is, this key political and religious figure, Jesus died at the hands of Pilate. Now, now Josephus isn't the only first century historian who wrote about Jesus. Tacitus was a Roman, again, a friend of Rome, but no friend of Christians. In his annals in Imperial Rome, he wrote this. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, 
Pontius Pilate. Again, we have a first century source writing at around the same time as the New Testament was being put together, recording exactly the same details. Different historical source, same facts. And if we then throw in the 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament that contain explicit references to Jesus' death, the only historically viable conclusion that we can draw from the evidence, from the first century evidence, from eyewitnesses from his followers, but also from impartial third parties, is that Jesus lived and died. That he died at the hands of a Roman governor, Pilate, and that he died by crucifixion. Friends, them's the facts. So if you're here sitting here and thinking up until now you've always doubted whether Jesus existed, that he ever lived, let me ask you, with that in front of you, have you changed your mind? If not, why not? What more could you reasonably expect? What could you require? What's on your list of things that you would need to see before you believed it? If you're not sure what else you'd need but you're not satisfied, ask yourself this. Is it a problem with the evidence or is actually it a problem with my heart and engaging with the evidence? Is the evidence the problem or is it me? Lee Strobel uh, is an award-winning legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, or he was. This guy is a serious, serious journalist. Eye on the facts. His wife became a Christian. And it greatly unsettled him. So he set out to prove that Christianity was wrong. And the more he looked at the evidence, the more troubled he was by it, until he realised that the evidence was overwhelming and his book, The Case for Christ, which is an easy read, takes you from his doubts to certainty to becoming a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He shares how the evidence compelled him to follow Jesus. You can grab it online as an e-book or you can grab it down at Jebel Ali. If you're after more evidence and you're not satisfied with what you've seen this morning, go and get it. It's too important to mess around. Well, what about some of you here this morning? You've always been told that it wasn't Jesus who died on the cross, but someone who looked like him. You've always thought that Christians were mistaken, that somebody else had died in Jesus' place. Let me ask you, as you look at the evidence, as you see impartial third-party evidence, not Christian propaganda, but Roman historians who had absolutely nothing to gain, has your view changed? If not, why not? If not, whose word do you trust more? The eyewitnesses or 21st century sceptics? The eyewitnesses or authors who are writing 600 years after the events, but who weren't themselves eyewitnesses? If you think that someone died in Jesus' place, if you think that he was taken up to heaven by God without dying, like Enoch and Elijah, let me ask you this. When did that happen? If it happened after the time of the crucifixion, why didn't Jesus, the word of God, let his disciples know? Why did God leave them in the dark? Why did he allow at least five of them to give their lives as martyrs because they believed he'd died and risen from the dead? When if he didn't die, he didn't rise, and those guys died for a lie. Why would Jesus let that happen? Why would God let that happen? Friends, if your view doesn't line up with the evidence, if the evidence unsettles you, it's worth asking, why do I believe what I do? What more do I need to change my thinking? If you need more, don't leave this morning without getting it. There's plenty more available. Come and see me afterwards. Okay, where are we up to? Jesus died. So, the next question is, what makes a Jewish carpenter's death a miracle? 
Because think about it, the Romans executed tens of thousands of people in the first century. None of their deaths are called a miracle. Why am I claiming that this death in particular is a miracle? Well, firstly, it's because his death was deliberate. Jesus gave up his life, and he gave it up for a reason. It didn't just happen. It happened as planned. Remember Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21? Remember what Jesus was doing? We read, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day rise again. This isn't a one-off reference. There are plenty more. Have a look at the list. These are just some of the references that explicitly have Jesus speaking about his death and resurrection. It doesn't include references to the Lord's Supper, the meal that he shared on the night before he died with his disciples, his final meal, which was all about his death. Friends, Jesus knew he was going to die. He deliberately planned to be in Jerusalem. He engaged deliberately in provocative discourse with the religious leaders. He knew the prophecies about his death. He knew that his heavenly father had had his death planned for centuries had been writing through the prophets about his death for centuries. He knew that his enemies were plotting his death. He knew that Judas would betray him. He knew that it was his life to give up. He knew that he'd come to earth to die. But I want you to notice this. Jesus wasn't some suicide bomber. He wasn't some guy who made videos of himself before his death explaining what he was about to do and what he hoped to achieve. Jesus' death was not about inflicting damage on others. It wasn't about killing his enemies. In fact, the only one who suffered was Jesus himself. Yes, those who loved him, they suffered, but their loss was just their loss of him. And Jesus' enemies... They weren't even touched except by his love because he died for them. Okay, you might be thinking, yes, Jesus knew that he was going to die. How does that make his death a miracle? I want to suggest to you that it's a miracle because this death has personally touched so many lives. Let me ask you this. Why would a death that took place 2,000 years ago have any impact on your life today? Let me ask you, can you do you know the names of your great, 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 great grandparents? I have no idea what my great, 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 great grandparents' names were. I don't care that they died, really. I've never, I've never even given them any thought. When did you last think about your great, 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 great? You never think about them. Their death means nothing to you. So why would the death of a Jewish carpenter 2,000 years ago mean anything to you, whether it was planned or not? Why would it have any impact on anybody living today? What is it that makes his death personal? Last weekend, I was forced to do some serious thinking about death and what it is that makes a stranger's death personal. I was reading the paper online at breakfast and I saw that there'd been a a plane crash in Russia. I just flicked to the next story. And then my wife said to me, Kaz said, it was a fly to buy plane. And all of a sudden, it became very personal. Because we've got friends who work in management at Dubai. I know pilots who fly with Fly Dubai. We, we know flight crew and ground crew. There are Russians in our congregation. And it, and it didn't take long for the events in another part of the world to suddenly become quite personal. I was on the phone making calls, scouring the web to find out who'd been impacted. You see, a death becomes personal when we're touched by it. How much more personal it must have been for those who lost family, whose friends never made it home, whose colleagues will never fly again. 
See, death becomes personal when we're touched by it. And the more significant the touch, the deeper we feel it. And when it comes to Jesus' death, it is incredibly personal. It is incredibly personal when we realise how significantly you and I have been touched by it. When we realise that it wasn't just a death, it was the death. It was the death that has the power to touch every single life that has ever been lived. You see, it wasn't just a death. It was a sacrifice. Not the sacrifice of giving up your seat on the metro for an old person like me. It was a sacrifice. It was a laying down of his life for me personally. It was a shedding of his blood for me personally. It was a giving up of his life sacrificially for mine. Look at the way the writer of the Hebrews puts it. In Hebrews chapter 10, he first talks about every other sacrifice that has ever been made by a priest. He writes this in verse 11. He says, And every priest stands daily at his service. Every day he's there. Every single day he's there, day in and day out, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which it would be okay if they actually did anything. But notice what the writer says. They offered repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Lamb after lamb, throat cut. Goat after goat, throat cut. Bull after bull, throat cut. Blood pours out, charred flesh, nothing achieved. What a soul-destroying occupation. Do something every single day that can never do anything. Something that promises so much and delivers zip. But verse 12, Jesus' sacrifice, his death was nothing like that. Done once, it touched everyone. Look at verse 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. What do you do at the end of the day? You know, at the end of the day, when the kids are in bed and all of a sudden it is quiet in the house, you sit down and you put your feet up, don't you? When Caroline and I got married, we bought a coffee table specifically that we were allowed to put our feet on. Because in my household, you were never allowed to put your feet on the coffee table. So we bought one that you could do just that with. Because we knew at the end of the day, ah, yeah, sit down, feet up. Friends, that's Jesus. One sacrifice made, job done, all accomplished. Looking forward to putting his feet up on his enemies who are going to be his footstool. Verse 13. He's waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. Why can he say the job is done? Verse 14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time us, those who are being made holy, sanctified by his death. You see, by a single offering, once, by giving up himself to be crucified once, by allowing his blood to be poured out and his body to be broken, by that single offering, he is perfected for all time those who are being made holy, us. And now that word perfected is just brilliant because it means to complete, to lack nothing, to be just the way that something was created to be. As a human being, I'm not perfect. I know that comes as a surprise to some of you, but it's true. And as a human being, you're not perfect, and that comes as no surprise to me. I'm not perfect. I'm not the way that I was created to be. I've been bent out of shape by the decisions that I've made, by the things that I've done and by the things that have been done to me. Every time I've rejected God's good plan for my life, I get another ding, another scar in my heart. 
Every time I decide that I know better than God, I get a little more twisted out of shape. And I've been doing this for 52 years. It doesn't matter if it's the small things like envy and pride and, and laziness and greed, or the more serious like hate and lust or the whatever. As I sin, my life gets more and more bent out of shape. I get more bent out of shape. How has Jesus' death personally touched me? Unbelievably intimately. At the heart of my very soul, he has made me perfect. He has touched me at the very core of my being and transformed my identity and given me a dignity that I do not deserve. Through Jesus' one sacrifice at one time, he has perfected me and taken me back to what God created me to be. He's done what no self-help book could ever do. He's undone my past. He's restored me back to my former glory. He's made me what I could never, ever strive to become. He's taken the list of all that I've done and nailed it to Jesus' cross. You see, BC gets it right. He's punished his son in my place so that my sin could become his, so that his perfection could become mine so that my heavenly Father could for the first time see me as perfect and could relate to me as perfect and love me as someone who was perfect. Perfection. Before you this morning. <laughs> Not because of the way that I work out. I don't understand why you're laughing but because of the way that his arms were stretched out. How good is that? How great a miracle is that? One man at one time made one sacrifice for all people at all time to make us perfect. Every single human being who has ever lived can be perfected through that one death. Every single person who would come to him and trust his death, every single one of us who would ask him to stand in our place and to take our sin on his cross, he promises to perfect you, me, everyone. Friends, there is no greater miracle than that. One man at one time dying for all people for all time to perfect us and to bring us back to God. There is no miracle that can touch anybody more profoundly than that, more personally than that, than someone stepping in and dying in my place. It doesn't get more personal than stepping in and paying for my sin. It doesn't get more personal than being forgiven at great cost. It doesn't get more personal than being perfected with his blood. It doesn't get more personal than being restored to God forever. You see, that's why I think Jesus' death is the greatest miracle of all. But the good news is it comes with a guarantee. Anyone can claim that their, their death can do incredible things. I can imagine the suicide bombers in Belgium last week thinking that their death would have an impact. Jesus can claim whatever he likes about his death. We can claim whatever we like about his death. But how do we know that his death actually worked? See, I could actually tell you that what we're going to do now is we're going to head out the door and we're going to go down in the lifts and we're going to walk out to Shakeside Road and then I am going to die for your sins. What we're going to do is I'm going to walk across Shakeside Road and get taken out by a Porsche 911 doing about 140. Okay? And after I get taken out, you guys will come back and have donuts and coffee and you'll chat with each other and you'll go, nice bloke, bit strange, Australian, uh, did his death work? Like, he said it would work, but how do we know? 
Because let's face it, if, if Jesus got himself crucified as a 33-year-old and his death didn't work, he just becomes one in a long list of religious charlatans. That's where the resurrection comes into play. It is our guarantee. Remember what Jesus promised over and over again before his death? Look at Matthew chapter 16 again, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Friends, again and again, he said, on the third day he would be raised. And the people of his day knew that he'd said it. He didn't just say it quietly to the disciples whispering in their ears. Remember Matthew 27? Jesus has been crucified, he's dead, and there were guards put on Jesus' tomb. Do you remember what Matthew 27 says about why the guards were there? Look at the conversation that saw the guards placed in, put in place. Verse 62, the next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and then tell the people, he's risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Jesus' claim about rising from the dead was public knowledge. His enemies knew about it. It wasn't something that was made up after the fact by his disciples. The guards were to ensure that nobody stole the body because they knew he was dead. But God promised that he would raise Jesus. And Jesus knew it. And on the third day, he was raised, guaranteeing our perfection, guaranteeing our forgiveness, guaranteeing that his death really has paid for our sin and reconciled us with the Father which helps us to understand just how exciting it must have been on that first Easter Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, when it finally dawned on them that Jesus really was alive. It wasn't just that they had their friend back. It was that all that he'd promised about himself was true, that he really had died for their sins that their forgiveness really was real, that this was the greatest miracle ever and it had been done for them and for anyone who would take it on board for themselves. What it meant for them, it means for us. See, how they felt 2,000 years ago is how we should feel today because Jesus' death is still incredibly personal. His resurrection is still the guarantee. It touches every single one of us. The grave is still empty. Jesus is still risen. And he's seated at the right-hand side of his Father because his sacrifice at one time, for all time, is still paying for your sin and mine and for your children and your grandchildren and great-grandchildren's sin. It's still ensuring that you and I can stand before our Heavenly Father, perfect always. So how do you feel about the greatest miracle of all? For me, I'm just incredibly grateful. I love being forgiven. I love it. I love and I'm incredibly grateful for being made perfect I love that God treats me and engages with me as if I'd never sinned. I love that Jesus died for me. I think it's just brilliant that he's got his feet up because the job is done and he's showering me and you with the benefits. And I just love seeing other people get it. I love it when the penny drops and they get to see what I've seen about Jesus' death. The greatest miracle of all was done for them. And I love it when the promise comes home to them. If that's you, if you get this, if you can see that Jesus' death really is the greatest miracle of all, if you can understand that the resurrection is proof, then I want you to do something. Are you ready? I want you to take out your phone. 
like they did in the video. Come on, take it out. Everybody take it out. You don't often get told to take out your phone in a sermon, but you should. Take it out. Normally you're told to put it away and stop looking at the stupid thing. Take it out. Don't check your emails. Go to WhatsApp or go to Messages. Because what I want you to do is I want you to choose one of your contacts, someone who doesn't know or isn't a follower of Jesus, and I want you to send them a message. The message is really, really simple. It's just this. Great news. One man at one time died for all people at all time. New paragraph. Let's chat. Now, you're taking a photo of the screen. Don't take a photo of the screen. (laughs) Type that into messages or WhatsApp, okay? Choose a contact, someone who does not know Jesus. Platinum, you're not getting off lightly, okay? You guys as well, get on, get your phones out. If you're at home, get your phone out. Who in your contacts doesn't know Jesus? Who can you, like, you just applauded when you saw that video clip a moment ago, Because you saw people captured by the death and resurrection of Jesus and their joy. If you've got that, get your phone out. Choose someone in your contacts and send them this message because they will reply. And when they do, just make a time to catch up for coffee or Coke or whatever. Make a time to Skype with them if they're in another country and just share with them what you learned today that you discover that one man at one time died for all people at all time and that you want to talk with them about it. Share Jesus with them. Share the greatest miracle of all with them. You don't have to get the words right. You just got to tell them your experience of his grace. Let them know the news. Let them know that 2,000 years old news is incredibly personal to you that it's impacted your life and you'd love it to impact theirs. Now, some of you are sitting here this morning thinking, oh, hang on, I'm not going to send that text out because all of this is new to me and I don't know. Oh, no, 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 no. I arrived with questions. I wasn't sure who Jesus was. Uh, if that's you, take out your phone. You take out your phone as well. Come on. I want everybody with a phone out. Okay, whether you want to share it with somebody or you haven't got a clue what it's all about. If, if that's the case, if you don't know what it's all about, I want you to find somebody in your contacts who you know follows Jesus. Not a religious person, but someone who follows Jesus, who trusts Jesus. Find someone in your contacts who does that. And what I want you to do is I want you to send them this message. Can we chat about Jesus' death, please? Because you know what? They will move hell and high water to get to your side to sit down and talk with you about Jesus because they would love for you to know the greatest miracle at all at work in your life as it is in theirs. And if as you look through your contacts list, you go, I actually have no idea who really loves and follows Jesus. Just look around your row. Somebody's just sent a message to one of their friends to say, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus' death. Grab them afterwards. Okay, say, can I have your phone number? I need to send you a text. Right? And they would love to get that text and sit down with you and chat with you about what it means to allow the greatest miracle of all to shape your life. All you've got to do is say, can we have a chat about Jesus' death? Let me assure you, they will never, ever say no because there is nothing that has shaped their lives more than that miracle. Don't leave today without telling somebody that you want to tell them or asking someone to help you to get it. How about I pray? Let's pray. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this extraordinary miracle, this grace of yours lavished out upon us. Father, help us to get Jesus' death intimately and personally and for ourselves. Help us to share it with others and help us to respond to it with faith and obedience. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.